announcement, and it's up there. Uh, party at Will's uh, and Rise Relief from Hilton Garden Inn around 7:45. Uh, I think I guess people are supposed to walk to the Hilton Garden Inn, and I think there's a map uh, in your packet. So um, should we eat dinner before the party? Eat dinner, yes. Okay. Dessert, no. Okay. Uh, drink, maybe. <laughs> 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 Good. All right, well, we're really happy to have uh, Jennifer Hilton from Davis, and she's going to talk about the Falcon Music Complex at the service. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be back in Georgia this week. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm interested in surfaces and green apples in, from lots of different points of view. And one of the ways that surfaces and green apples have been studied in the last, uh, say, 20 years um, originated with an idea of Kakemizu. So Kakemizu was actually studying cypher surfaces for knots, for those of you who think that means something. There's a particular class of surfaces in a in particular class of three manifolds. And uh, what he did was he looked at isotopic classes of surfaces um, and uh, constructed a complex out of this. And I've been looking at this Kakemizu complex in more generality in the three-dimensional setting where it was sort of conceived of uh, together with Piotr Chetitsky. But more recently, what I've been trying to do is take everything down one dimension. So rather than studying surfaces in three manifolds, right now I'm studying curves in surfaces. In fact, though, as I discovered recently, all this is work in progress. The ink is not yet dry not just curves, but multi-curves in surfaces. So multi-curves in surfaces rather than surfaces in three manifolds, of course. Medium range goal then is to use the curves in surfaces, use some product constructions, and whatever insights I get in this setting, I'll boot back up into the setting of surfaces in three manifolds. But as far as today is concerned, for the most part, I'm just talking about multi-curves in surfaces. So we have a compact orientable surface, and moreover, we are actually also interested in a primitive relative homology class. And primitive relative homology class, right, so we're restricting to certain multi-curves, mainly those that realize this primitive relative homology class. Okay? So so you're going to have a picture here. I can always come back. Uh, right? Compact orientable surface. You can go back to that? I'll go back to the definition of this one. <laughs> picture here, right? Picture is worth a thousand words. Then we go back and look at the formal definition. Um, so just the curves and the surfaces, multi curves. And uh, as you'll see, I want the complement of this to be connected. Um, I will, rather than um, talking about curves where you have parallel components, in which case, of course, the complement will not be connected, I will need to think of weighted curves, right? So if I have my oriented curve, a weight of two, well, you can think about it as two parallel curves, but that is only useful in some contexts, not in others. Let's go back to the formal definition. Now that you have a picture of the multi-curve sitting in the surface. So a cipher curve, again, those of you familiar with knot complements and how three manifold topologists think about them, you know about cipher surfaces, so again, this is the analogy one dimension down. A cipher curve for this pair, compact oriental surface, primitive relative homology class, is a pair, a weighted curve, C is a union of pairs to an oriented simple closed curves, and N arcs, by the way. Right? If our surface has boundary, we also have arcs. And W is a set of weights, right? An N tuple of non zero integers such that the weighted homology class equals alpha, right? Realize alpha. Um, moreover, what we require then is that the complement of this curve, right, when we're just looking at the curve, forgetting about weights for a moment, that needs to be connected. That's actually important in the constructions that I like to use. And so um, we'll talk about the underlying curve of a cipher curve. And 
uh, I might need this notation. Actually, I think in this talk, I will need a reference notation for this way to multi curve. <laughs> Yeah, going back to your, your motivation about ciphered surfaces for knots, uh -huh. I, I would have assumed that you would want on the boundary to pick some some points on the boundary and only look at kind of uh, uh, curves that basically had those bound, as boundary. Is there some reason um, why that's not the right? Uh, that would be an extra assumption. It appears to me that I don't need it. Again, this is work in progress. The ink isn't yet dry. The small chance that you know I might have to do something like that, but I'm hoping not. Does X necessarily have boundary or not? No, not necessarily. Okay. okay, so for those of you familiar with my work with uh, Piotr Kshetitsky, we don't assume that our three manifolds have boundary there, but in the case where there's no boundary, you don't get anything interesting. So that is a good question, right? So here with the surfaces, oh, well, you get interesting things even in the closed case. We're not making an assumption there. Okay, so there's our ciphered curve, right? Complement and disconnected, weights, so, so so S is not analogous to S2, it's analogous to like not complement, the complement. Yeah, 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 right. exactly. Okay, and then by the way, I will occasionally forget to mention the weight, just talk about the underlying curve, because I can, right? If I have a curve and some weighted version of it is supposed to realize a certain homology class, then uh, subject to an important assumption, which I haven't yet made, which I should make, is as long as the curves are oriented so that my weights are positive, and I can decree that I do this, then the weights are uh, uniquely determined by the underlying curve, just due to the fact that I'm trying to realize that I am realizing a certain model, a relative homology class. Okay, so just linear algebra. The important tool and the reason why I want the complement of my multi-curve to be connected has to do with a, a certain um, cyclic covering space. In this context that some of you are familiar with, right? Not complements, they're sort of canonical type of cyclic covering. In a more general setting, once you fix this relative primitive homology class, you also get a canonical infinite cyclic covering associated with that. Right, you have a homology class, you have a dual, it's a cohomology class. You're talking about one dimensional thing, so it lifts to a map on, a, on the fundamental group, a homomorphism on the fundamental group, and then you have a kernel, you take the covering of space corresponding to that normal subgroup. Um, and so we have this infinite cyclic covering space of the surface. And since alpha is primitive, you can think of this infinite cyclic covering space as being realized by taking a single connected curve that represents that homology class. Right? And that'll then have weight one, special case. And then you cut open along that curve and take a z's worth of copies and mash them up along their boundary components. With the, the remnants of the boundary where you, where you cut along that curve representing the homology class. Okay. So it's a, what do you call it? Sort of the surface minus the curve lifts to that. You have this infinite to that. Infinite like cover associated with alpha. Okay, so this is very schematic, right? Very schematic lifts of my surface. And what I've drawn there then is note, um, I'm thinking of having different representatives for alpha. I'm thinking of having one representative C in my surface downstairs and one representative C prime. And what I will be looking at is the lifts of the complements of these curves. Again, important that they're connected. That's why my lifts are really uh, uniquely determined, right? I mean, you can look at this lift rather than that lift, but you don't have lifts where I say, do I have this or do I have that, right? No um, choices involved there. Okay. All right, so with that in mind, we're ready 
to define the Kakimizu complex of a surface. And by the way, when I say Kakimizu complex of a surface, I'm always thinking of a fixed choice of um, relative homology class. So, right? The Kakimizu complex of a surface is not unique, but I'm always thinking about a particular one, namely one with respect to whatever alpha I'm looking at. All right, and the vertices of the complex I build are just isotopy classes of these weighted curves. And again, right, we really need to just think about the underlying curves here. So vertices are um, uh, cipher curves up to isotopy underlying curves. Okay, okay. edges. Oh. Sorry, and just, just to be clear, when you have vertices, you, you, you make an equivalence between like weight two and one curve and having two parallel curves. Okay, two okay so two parallel curves is actually not okay, right? That's not a cipher curve because the complement isn't connected. All right. Right. So having the one curve with weight two, fine, okay. but we don't have the two, two uh, parallel curves. And again, when I'm talking about the If it works, then certainly I have to see us making my assumptions. Okay, so we have the vertices of complex. How about edges? All right. So here is where I'm really using these ideas coming from Kakimi's a complex of three dimensions rather than some of the ideas that have been used in the context of surfaces of building complexes using curves or multi curves in the surfaces. So what I do is I say, right, I have my pair of vertices, I have their representatives. I look at the complements and I lift them to the covered space. That way I was drawn here, right? And now notice how um, I've, uh, I've written C sub m and then C sub m minus 1, C sub m plus 2 plus 1. Those are different lifts of the curve C and then C naught prime is a lift of C prime, the other multi-curve. Again, that's very schematic. And uh, then an unlabeled lift, another unlabeled lift of C prime <coughs> right up there, right? Just in my notation, it would be C1 prime. But notation doesn't, doesn't matter. What matters is to visualize these lifts of complements to this infinite cyclic cover. Infinite cyclic cover, the special thing about it is that you have this covering translation. Right? And so really you have these things stacked on top of each other. And what we want to do is we want to look at how much the uh, a lift of the complement of C prime, so this thing there, how many how many lifts of the complement of the other curve it intersects. Right? So in this case we would have what one, two, three, four. So, if uh, representatives of, of our vertices, if there are representatives of our vertices, such what, that the lift of S minus C prime intersects exactly two lifts, two, not four as we had in the picture, but just two um, lifts of S minus C, then those two vertices span an edge. Right? So this doesn't have to be true for all representatives, but they have to be representatives for which this is true. That's when we span an edge. Okay, now when you think of a natural definition that has been used when people look at curves and surfaces and build complexes, people often look at disjoint things. Okay? that would be a weaker condition than this. All right, when you have these representatives such that the lift of the complement of one intersects exactly two lifts of the complement of the other, that does imply that those representatives are disjoint. Right? The underlying curves are disjoint, but it's stronger than that. So, so this is a subcomplex of some complex, 
Yeah, those would be formulated with either Hatcher's cyclic cycle complex or Ermer's homology curve complex. This complex will have fewer edges than those complexes, right? The vertex sets, actually the vertex set of this complex um, may be equal to the vertex set of one of those, but a subset of the other, because I can't remember how they deal with the connected complement. I think I might have fewer vertices as well, but I certainly have fewer edges. All right, so here's an edge in all of the com complexes we just mentioned, and certainly this one. And here is something that's not an edge. Okay, so there's two multi-curves here, one labeled C, one labeled C prime. And these two multi-curves, right, weights are just one, I haven't written anything, I'd love to say they're one. Those two multi-curves represent the same homology class. Um, but in the Kakimusa complex, they will not span an edge. Okay, this curve that I've drawn exits one side of C and arrives back on the other side of C and it intersects C prime twice with the same orientation, same oriented intersection number. That means that when you look at lists of complements, the um, complement of C lifts to something that intersects three lifts of the complement of C prime. So I have uh, vertices and edges, and now I just make life easy for myself. I say a uh, flag complex is a um, simple complex in which any time the one skeleton spans a simplex, that simplex also is in the simple complex. So now I say I've described the one step, I've described the vertices and the, and the edges. Take the smallest flag complex that has that one step. That's what I'm calling the Kakamusa complex. Let's look at some, some examples. Okay, Kakamusa complex of the annulus. Trivial. Uh, there's one interesting world topology class, which is the only non trivial one, um, primitive. And so there's a representative, everything else is isotopic to that. So that's trivial. That's all I say in all of those words. Likewise, in the case of a torus, you can make different choices for your primitive homology class. Right? So you have infinitely many non-trivial Kakamisa complexes, but each of them is also just trivial. Okay, so one thing that comes out of this is um, Well, you want to compare it to other complexes. And when I tried to do that, I realized I had to prove a few more things about how simplices sit inside, right, that the vertices corresponding to simplices sit inside of the surface. Um, what you can do is take geodesic representatives for the underlying curve. Moreover, when you have arts in the underlying curve, you can make sure that they're geodesic and they meet the boundary uh, perpendicularly. And the advantage of doing that is that you know that if curves can be isotopic to be disjoint, they are disjoint. So the sets of curves are all disjoint. Um, moreover, if they're uh, realizing intersection number, well, it takes a little bit of work, but you want them to realize intersection number simultaneously. And you can do that by looking at um, the geodesics I was describing. And then the thing is, you want to compare these curves to each other. 
And this picture of this infinite cyclic cover means, okay, somewhere you have C sitting, and then let's call them actually C naught, C1, C2, C3, and so forth. They'll start at zero, they'll start at zero, right? C naught up to Cn. So C naught is uh, one curve, and then the other ones are all disjoint from it. Moreover, they're all separating in the infinite cyclic covering. So you really think of having a lift of C naught here, and then a lift of C1, well, it's either above or below that. And up to renaming, you can say it's above that. And continuing on in that vein, up to renaming, you can just say, oh, you have C0, C1, C2, C3. Their lifts are all stacked nicely on top of each other. And why is this interesting? It's actually a good way to realize your simplex. And it shows us that um, uh, vertices in the Kakimizu complex, which span a simplex, if we think of those vertices as sitting in Hatcher's cyclic cycle complex, also span a simplex because this was his condition of spanning a simplex. Oh, sorry, sorry. I wrote this curve complex here. He actually called it cyclic cycle complex. Is it related complex. to inferior numbers? Yes, yes. And in fact, my terminology, the homology curve complex, um, that's actually Ingrid Irma's terminology. Okay, so uh, Ingrid Irma's complex, um, the Kakamisa complex is sort of more immediately seen to be a subcomplex of Ingrid Irma's complex. Um, I think she, has, uh, she doesn't make as strong assumptions on the vertices in terms of connected complements, so I think she'll have more vertices than the Kakamisa complex, and she should, certainly has more edges because she only requires disjointness as opposed to any of the stronger conditions. In Hatcher's definition of the PI are connected, is that right? They are actually. So I think the vertex set um, for Hatcher's cyclic cycle complex is probably the same. And now, again, the ink isn't dry on this. I'm guessing that this might actually, with this, the weights now, be exactly Hatcher's um, cyclic cycle complex. So in that other example you showed, the homology was not Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's probably exactly the same now. Um, so it's actually rather than we have a the best thing to do Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, in January, I posted a paper about this, and I didn't realize that I made the weights, and then kind inquiries from Dan Morgallop, more direct inquiries from Alan Hatcher made me realize that I needed to introduce the weights, and that part, the ink is dry here. Wait for an update in the next two weeks to see a reposting of that paper with this modified definition. And then, um, whereas I thought that my Kakamizu complex was a subcomplex of Hatcher's cyclic second complex, it seems that it's actually equal to that. And so, um, some of my work then could be viewed as rediscovering some of Hatcher's work and also some uh, work with Hatcher and Dan's, Allen's and Dan's. Um, but I think it's still interesting to sort of reinterpret it all from the point of view of this tool that using the infinite cyclic covering makes it more appealing to um, bring on full topologists because they recognize something there. And for me, it's also very interesting to see how this relates to other work that's being done. Okay. And Hatcher uh, computed the dimension of his cyclic cycle complex. And that computation then still carries over in the case of a closed surface, right? So um, the dimension of the Kakamizu complex is twice the genus of S minus 3 for a closed surface. And I think of that as negative the Euler characteristic minus 1. Here's a simplex that realizes that. So these numbers here are actually not weights right now, right? These are Think of those as C sub 0, C sub 1, C sub 2, C sub 3. You know how they're sort of uh, um, located in the cyclic order, right? 0 and 1 are the oriented boundary of a subsurface. 1 and 2 are the oriented boundary of a subsurface. 2 and 3, 3 and 0. That's where Hatcher's terminology comes from. Okay, so what we see here is genus 3 surface. One of the characteristic is 2 minus 3G, so um, minus 4. Um, and we have four subsurfaces here, right? 
four vertices, dimensions three then. Okay, so this, you could generalize this to, to higher genus surfaces, you get an upper bound on the dimension, excuse me, a lower bound on the dimension, and then uh, an Euler characteristic argument allows you to get an upper bound. Right? So this analogy is this equivalence of Hatcher's curve complex, right? Um, between any of those two vertices. Number one, you have them arranged in a cyclic order, and number two, you have some sort of surface for which successive vertices, if you number them, are uh, co-bounding that surface. Sorry, they're the oriented boundary on that surface. And that surface better not be a disk or an and, unless it's some such thing. So it'll have negative Euler characteristic, right? Negative one or something less, or more in terms of absolute value, and that's why we get um, negative chi s pieces, but again, the simplex of four vertices is dimension three, right? So you have a minus one. This is the number where you say that that's where the count is coming from, then you can rephrase it in terms of numbers. Okay, so uh, that's the case for closed surfaces. And then you wonder, well, what about compact surfaces when the boundary is not empty? And when the boundary is not empty, things change a little bit. Let's look at the picture. Okay. So this is uh, a, poly a polygonal rep a representation of a surface, right? We need to identify some edges here, but notice how there's lots of punctures in the surface. And what I've drawn is um, a set of vertices, right, starting from zero. Right? You see them up there, but they're also here, right? Zero and one are the oriented boundary of a subsurface and so forth. Uh, one and two, two and three, three and four, four and five. And note that the, the subsurface of which these uh, multiples are the oriented boundary need not be connected. It need not be connected. And then you look at these pieces and you say, ooh, negative one. We don't necessarily get that low, right? When you look at this triangle, you say that's not quite, that's sort of half of negative one. So then what you need to do is just fix a notion of complexity that allows you to sort of measure this. In some sense, you're always capturing one half of negative one between a pair of vertices and so manage to do that computation, um, this is what you get, right? So rather than just the Euler characteristic, you have twice the Euler characteristic now. That's as many vertices as you can get. Because you just have one half, and get one half between them. And then again, minus one is coming because you have some number of vertices and the dimension is one less than that. Is that the dimension of the R complex? That's a good question. Does anybody happen to know? Um, it, it might very well be, but I'm not sure, actually, because of the cyclic business, right? So that might be a strong assumption. But that's what my good question. Okay, right. Um, so we talked about edges, and then um, a notion that comes from Kakimizu is actually the distance between vertices. So you look at the same picture we had when we were thinking about edges. Remember we span an edge if and only if when you look at these lifts, the lift of the complement of one intersects exactly two lifts of the complement of the other. So that's what we will declare to be distance one in this measurement more generally, right? If the lift of one complement intersects n lifts of the other complement, the distance between the two vertices is, let's say, the distance between those um, underlying curves of representatives is n minus one, right? The number of lifts intersect at minus one and then the distance between two vertices is the minimum we can get in the representatives. 
Okay. So here you have four. Um, right. This lift with intersect of one, two, three, four of the lifts of the other, so the distance is three. Again, this is very schematic, so I'm assuming that you know minimal intersections are are in the lines here. Okay, so Kakimizu defined that, and moreover, he said this is a metric. Okay, I'll say a few words about that because it's kind of nice to think about. Um, so for a vertex of itself, we just declared it to be zero, and then you say, what, this definition? Is it really symmetric? So I had the lift of the complement of C prime intersecting four lifts of the complement of C. Does that mean that the lift of the complement of C intersects four lifts of the complement of C prime? It sure does, because what you should think about is translating this whole thing up and up. And then you look at the subdivision you get for this piece here. Right? So this piece will be this whole complement of the lift, uh, the whole lift of the complement of C is filled up by this piece and this piece and this piece and something down here. So just by looking at these translates and how that the lift is chopped up, you say, oh yes, it intersects the same number of lifts. Okay, so um, triangle inequality, I'll wave my hands and say three words about that at least. Um, so, you're looking at C and C prime, and now you have some other thing. You call it D, right? And you're thinking triangle inequality. Distance C, C prime compared to distance C, D, D, C prime. So what you need to think about, you have this lift. And now you're thinking of translates of the lift of some other complement covering that. And the point is that whatever you use to cover that lift, those translates have to go at least this far down and at least that far up. And then you can say, OK, those meet some number of these lifts. Right? One of those meets some number of those. And then I have some number of translates. Okay, they have, OK, one, two, three, some number. And then plus that, so if you've met n lifts before, when you think about one, two, three, n, and then you count that one again, and say you have one, two, three, four, some number of lifts, lift, you realize you get, when you sum those two numbers, n plus one, meaning whatever they were, break it into two, uh, the sum, once you subtract one, will be n minus one, which is what the distance was. Okay, so that's a metric. So how does that metric compare to the half metric you get by declaring each edge of the one? Exactly, that's a good question. And the beauty of it is that it's equal to the half metric. Again, uh, Kakimizu did also observe this. Right, so one, um, <coughs> To prove the equality, you would have to uh, put two inequalities, and one of them is easy, one of them is a little harder, a little harder, a lot harder. They actually generated the tool that I like to use, though Kakimizu didn't quite raise it or really fully explore it the way I can tell. Um, yeah, I'd have to sit down and think, which is the easy direction, which is the harder direction. I'll, I'll leave that as an exercise, right? One direction is easier, one direction is harder. If you have a, a path that realizes the, uh, the graph distance, okay. the length of that is um, exactly the number of edges you have. And each of those edges is distance one in the Kakimizu complex. Now apply the triangle inequality. So what you get is right, path distance is greater than or equal to uh, graph distance is greater than or equal to the Kakimizu distance. Going the other way, what we'll see is that we 
can actually construct the tool that I will discuss now, but yeah, I will. It uh, really constructs a, it's not quite a canonical path, but it constructs a path between vertices that realizes Kakimi's of distance. That's the Kakimi's of distance we have photographed this place. Okay, the other thing coming out of the fact that these two are equal, right? Once you know, oh, I have this um, distance and I can compute it by looking at lifts of things. Um, and it equals uh, the graph distance. Right, graph distance is the minimal number of edges required in a path. Right? If I can convince you that the Kakimiza distance is always finite, then we all, all automatically get that the graph distance is finite, which means that the Kakimiza complex is connected. Okay, and the reason that um, the Kakimiza distance is finite is because we're looking at lifts of things. And we, when we're looking at the lifts of the curves, we have to remember that this multi-curve realized our um, homology class. And that we're looking at the infinite cyclic cover that's associated with that. And that the um, function on, on the fundamental group that we have is realized by intersection number with these representatives, weighted intersection number with these representatives. Okay. All right, in particular, any representative has a weighted intersection zero, but even if I just take a connected component of it, it'll have intersection number zero with that thing. And so that means it lifts to something compact. So if the boundary of my lift is compact, I have the sense that I have a frontier, yes, then I know that the whole thing is compact. The completion is like that. This would have a completion, so it's compact. And so there's a finite number of things. Okay. All right, so Kakimizu uh, distance is finite. It's equal to graph distance, so Kakimizu complex of the surface is connected. And right, by any homology group, you have to a homology class, you're not going to be able to know. Okay. I have a question. Do you think Hasher proved that it's retractable? He did, right, and I'm reproving it using this machinery. So that's a one of the things. They just wanted to take the machine work from the three dimensions, pull it down, and then what I discovered in the prosecutor is that uh, I am sort of redoing what Hatcher did. I'm uh, thinking about it from a different point of view. But yeah, when you work through it, actually, actually Hatcher gave two proofs of contractibility, right? And so when you look at his first proof, that kind of mimics what you get when you think of his construction rather than in the surface itself, lifting to the cover. Okay, so uh, this is the part that I like though, right? You have the infinite cyclic cover. And so you can think of having your lifts and projecting. Okay. So actually, let's look at it. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, projection map. Um, so describing it that way. Thinking of it as a projection map, and then really exploiting it to its fullest, I think Shitetsuki and I did that. Kakumizu kind of had it implicit in his work, but didn't really realize how, what a neat tool it is. So the idea is, you have these two different lifts of curves, and you want to project one onto the other. Right? It's not at all symmetric. So I'm projecting C prime onto C. And remember, these things are separating in the infinite cyclic cover. So I really just say, well, I have everything underneath C prime, and I have everything underneath the topmost copy of a lift of C that some particular lift of C prime intersects. Right? And then I say everything underneath this, everything underneath this. I intersect those and take the frontier of that. And. Um, Again, here I have to be a little careful because of the, the weighted curves, right? So in this moment, when I uh, really write down every detail of this projection map, rather than looking at a weighted curve, I will actually replace it with a curve with lots of parallel components and then 
do this projection successively. But you know, if you have lots of parallel curves in C prime, right, just that top portion, just think of them doing this again and again and again, the same move. All right. Um, I'm saying everything I need to say. Let's go back. Uh, the point then is, when, when I do this projection, I'm really singling out one lift of C naught, uh, C prime, and I'm taking the highest lift of C that it intersects. Right? So when I do this projection, I will not bump into some other lift of C prime. Right, highest one, the next lift of C prime goes at most up here, and the projection starts, like it's, but the top of the projection is above that. Okay, that means that uh, in terms of where things sit in the covering space, right, the projection will be between C prime and the lift of C prime below that C prime minus one. And uh, then when I look at the, the complement, a lift of the complement of a projection, I see that it doesn't meet as many lifts of the complement of C. And what that gives me then is, number one, so I'm projecting B prime onto B, C prime onto C. Um, the distance with B prime will be exactly one in light of the those. So you get exactly the intersection of how you need. And um, let's look at this one. Right, there's actually a more general principle there. If I project two different things, I actually uh, also decrease distance. But that's actually more technical. I mean, we shouldn't talk about that right now. Um, and the other thing is, right, also compare it to V, you've gotten a little bit closer to V. Okay, this is why I call it a projection map, because you think of V sitting there, you have V prime, you've produced a vertex that's closer to V. Okay. That's the um, argument for connectivity, is that what this is, this, is your, this is the argument to show that this complex is connected? Uh, no, connected came from just the fact that the Kakimisa distance is finite and it's equal to graph distance. Right. And if vertices have um, a finite okay, graph right. distance, then there is a path of a particular length. Isn't this, length giving, a a Isn't this giving you a path in the complex? Or? It is giving me a path in the complex. So this actually helps prove the other inequality for showing that the Kakimisa distance is equal to the graph distance. So this yeah. constructs a sort of canonical path. Well, It'll be a path of length, whatever the Kakimisa distance so, so, is. So this is the deformation rate. Yeah, it sounds like this, yeah, is a, yeah. this is showing contractibility, right? Yeah, it is, exactly. Path. Okay, this is the tool I'm pulling it out, rather than just sort of using this argument in my contractibility tool. So so I'm pulling this out as something. Um, no, not quite. So this is where we differ, right? But uh, it's a little bit hidden. What I like about this argument is really it's more explicit. You kind of see the projection and so forth. Hatcher needs to do some work to kind of isolate some surgeries that he does on the curve. And when you think about it long enough, it's stuff that's lift, that lifts to something like this. Right? So it's sort of related, but not quite the same. So they are different paths. Yeah, oh, and in fact, um, there's something a little bit non-canonical here, because uh, what I should mention is, When I do this, um, I have to worry about the complement of the resulting curve being connected. And it's not automatically connected. I mean, number one, this is why I have to introduce weights, because I might get parallel components. But anything else, um, either I have something that's not homologous, curves that are not homologous, I guess you can just throw them out. Or I have pairs of curves that are, like, not pairs. I have a subsurface that's partitioned, the boundary is partitioned into um, 
pieces that have equal uh, homology, right? And then I can just do a replacement game where I replace one curve with, or some, with subset with a, with a subset of the other and just add to the weight. And that way I construct something of weighted multi-curve with a connector complement. You can think of this as landing in the middle of a simplex or middle of a set of this complex. Instead of shifting the weights and choosing, like if, you, if they land in an edge, instead of picking one direction or the other, you can okay. think of going through the middle of the edge. You could, you could, but so I want to really fix my projection map so that, yeah, maybe you go through and think of going through that, but at the end, my projection map spits out a vertex, right? And then it's a non canonical vertex. But as long as it spits out a vertex and it's side which one, then it's like this. That was for a compact subset of the techniques of complex set of plane half deep, right? So there are some choices involved. It's not canonical, but there is such a such an Um, so, yes, this uh, projection map gives us a, a shortest path, right? something that realized the, the Cartesian distance, and we saw before that that was greater than or equal to the path distance. Okay. Um, and it allows us to prove that the Cartesian complex of the surface is contractible, and I think you two at least have already constructed the proof in your mind now. But, um, so you choose a vertex, and the general idea, right? Use a projection map to on the top, back of, sorry, S alpha, in, into that vertex. And of course, you need to make sure that this really gives you a contraction map. The type of thing that Chichisky really taught me is that Whitehead, Whitehead has wonderful theorems. Um, so, for instance, to prove that this whole non compact complex is connected, you can actually limit yourself to saying any compact uh, subcomplex is contained in a contractible subcomplex. Okay. And if I take any compact subcomplex, um, we will, I'll, I need to, in order to run the right argument, this business with the projection map, I would need to extend that to make sure that it's a flag, subcomplex, and also that it contains all of these paths, right? Complex, subcomplex, finite number of pairs of vertices, but you need to contain all of these paths. But once you contain a path, you also contain the path. So, I mean, any vertex, that you, any immediate vertex, you kind of automatically get the paths you need. Okay, and then once you do that, you can, run this argument of the projection map. Just project everything on for me. Um, and if one thing I had said when I defined my, my projection map, I had said, oh, and the distance between vertices decreases. You have to do a little bit more work to show that. But the idea is to start with vertices of distance one, not equal to me, right? And say, how does the projection one compare to the other? And if they're distance one, they sit nicely in the infinite cyclic cover, saying that one is above the other. And so you can do your projection map, first the one that's lower and then the one that's higher up, and you get things that behave nicely. Right? So the uh, distance will be less than equal to one. Maybe, maybe they're, they become equivalent. But Certainly the distance does not increase. And then just extend that by looking at paths. Extend that to show that distance between any two vertices decreases and then well, does not increase under the projection map. And that gives you everything you need to show that this is a contraction map. And that proves contractibility. Um, one case, I guess I don't have a slide for this, but one case I'm kind of interested in is uh, the genus 2 surface. It's actually somewhat special. Those of you who know Ingrid Irwin's complex know that she proved that it is um, not delta hyperbolic, but as long as your genus is, I think, at least 3. And so in general, you think of something that's kind of quasi-Euclidean. OK, genus 2, that's not true. When you look at the dimension, you get something that's one-dimensional. So it's a tree because it's contractible. So it's actually delta hyperbolic. 
So that's an interesting example then of having companies with complex of surface that's delta hyperbolic. And in the case of three dimensions, right, when you just take the surface across the interval, say, uh, see if this still works if you take it across um, a circle. Probably does. You probably have homology classes where you get uh, hyperbolic, delta hyperbolic continuous of complexes. And one reason why that's particularly interesting is because the Kakimis of complex not complex is fairly well understood now. The ink isn't drawing on all of this, but basically it looks like the Kakimis of complex are not complex, it's quasi Euclidean. That comes from sort of understanding how tori sit in a not complement, and it's fairly special. Um, there's classical work of Schubert, and then more recently Ryan Butt really did a very good comprehensive description of how tori sit in there. And that allowed um, Johnson, Palai, and Wilson to prove that the Kakimis of complex are not, meaning the Kakimis of complex are not complement, is, is quasi Euclidean. Okay. But then this work, right, again, once you sort of move it back up to three dimensions, shows that there are three manifolds, but that's not the case. There are three manifolds with homology classes, such that the, the Kakimis of complex is delta hyperbolic. Thank you for again.